ladies and gentlemen, I give you the wonderful Dr. Alibi <laughs> speaking on Isma Islamic perspectives on end of life issues and death. Dr. Alibi. Thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be here and it's an honor to be able to speak about and share some of these issues and perspectives and I welcome comments and feedback. And what I'm going to be speaking about, as Rory said, is Islamic perspectives on end of life issues and death. This is a calligraphic representation of the common invocation that Muslims state whenever we begin any activity and I won't belabor the Arabic and this is just as I say calligraphy but the literal translation would be I begin this activity or I begin in the name of God the most beneficent the most merciful and so I hope he will uh, bless this occasion for all of us and uh, protect me from doing anything uh, terrible or stupid uh, we'll see how we do the outline of what I hope to go over today is a brief introduction to Islam and then talk a little bit about the Islamic laws that provide the foundation for an ethical understanding from an Islamic perspective. I'll take two minutes to give a very brief historical interlude uh, to you in order to help you understand some of the sectarian issues within Islam that have implications for bioethics for those of you who may interact with patients or with individuals who are assisting around bioethical discourse, whether that's an imam or, or other scholars. And then we'll focus in on some of the Islamic ethical issues from a foundational perspective as well as some of the clinical implications. And then if we have time, which I hope we do, I was going to spend five minutes talking about some aspects around death and dying from an Islamic perspective that are not ethical as much as they are more ritual and spiritually oriented in order to let you be aware of some of the, the rich spiritual traditions within Islam around death and dying. And then I'll summarize very briefly at the end. So I hope I will be covering the things that you want to know about and we're hoping to receive uh, information on today. Um, but if I don't cover them, then, then maybe you need to change what you want. Maybe you need to want the things I'm going to tell you about. We'll see. So starting off with Islam is the youngest of the three major monotheistic or Abrahamic religions. And literally it means submission or active submission to the will of God. And although in, in Arabic and in the Quran we talk about Allah as the, the deity and as our God, um, I will be using the term God in English because it's easier for, for people to follow. Um, and Allah is loosely translated as God, but there are some very specific differences between why Allah is not the same as God, but I'm not going to get into that today. There are over 1.5 billion Muslims in the world and over 1 million Canadians. Some estimates put it significantly higher than that. And in Western nations, Islam is the, one of the most rapidly growing religions, partly because of the immigration demographic and partly because of the number of uh, children that Muslim immigrants who already arrived in these countries have. And so we will be seeing more and more and interacting more and more with Muslims in these societies that we live in. So the principal beliefs of Islam can be summarized in a couple of key uh, terms that we use and that are common across all of the major sects within Islam. And the first principle is that of God being one and unique and really incomparable. And the chapter in the Quran that's there uh, has four very brief verses that really form the basis of exegesis that can go on into multiple books that really talks about this philosophy and conceptualization of God as the one and the unique. Um, but that's the first principle within the tenets of Islam. The second is the concept of prophethood and really that God has committed to humankind from the beginning until the end of time to have divine guidance that is sent down in the form of his chosen messengers that will guide humanity. And the first of those prophets for us in Islam is Prophet Adam and goes through 124,000 different prophets that were sent down over a span of, of several thousand years and ended with the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him and indeed peace be upon every one of the messengers of God. And from an Islamic perspective, our belief is that every single one of those messengers of God had a divine purpose, a divine appointment, and was indeed sinless and rightly guided. And then finally, the third major principle in our belief is the belief in a day of resurrection, a belief in an afterlife, and a belief in a day of, of judgment, if you wish, 
after which one gets sent to heaven or hell based on their activities and uh, the various things they have done in this current abode or this temporary life. Now the Islamic laws then are derived from these principles and come really from four sources. The two primary sources are the Holy Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad and I'll talk about each of these uh, in following slides. So the Quran. So this is the holy book of Muslims as many of you know and by the way I apologize some of you may find this very rudimentary very basic and I do apologize but I want to make sure that we're all on the same ground and have the same basic understanding. So our belief is that the Quran is a book that was revealed in pieces or segments to the holy prophet and was revealed over a period of 23 years to him. It contains approximately 6,300 verses that are organized into 114 chapters and 30 major parts of the book, each is equal in size. And those chapters range from very small ones that are three or four verses to the largest chapter, which is 286 verses and spans almost a, th a tenth of the entire book. And each chapter is devoted to different themes and messages and ideas uh, throughout the book. But this is the basis of our, of our belief from which the laws are derived. And the belief from Muslims is that it is the unadulterated word of God, that God himself in the Quran indicates that he will protect until the end of time. And these verses were revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. At the same time, God states in the Quran quite clearly that not every verse can be interpreted literally. Many of the verses are allegorical and have deeper mystical meaning, but certainly cannot be interpreted in a literal sense, uh, for that may risk error and misunderstanding. Which then means, of course, that if some of these verses are not so easy to interpret, whether one is a master of the Arabic language or not, it means that one needs a living guide, someone who will interpret the book. And that, of course, uh, is the message that, that we believe came from Prophet Muhammad. So the second major source then of our laws and our understanding of the religion is his sunnah. And so what does that mean? Well, a little bit about his life, very briefly. He was born in the year 570 AD in the town, or, or I believe it was still a town at that stage of Mecca in, in Saudi Arabia. And as I said, he was the final messenger in this chain of prophetic uh, transmission that began with Adam and included many of the prophets that are held near and dear to Christians and Jews including Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, Jesus, and many others that are common to, to our various faiths. And the Prophet Muhammad began his mission to preach this new religion, Islam, to the local, mostly pagan Arabs uh, in Mecca at the age of 40 and continued to preach for 23 years until, until he died at the age of 63. We believe as Muslims that he was the voice, the living voice of the Quran and its main interpreter and teacher for us and that the various things that he said, the actions that he did, the letters that he wrote, the speeches that he gave, all of these comprise this corpus which is the sunnah or the tradition of the prophet that we then go back to to derive our laws and understand them based on all of these things that he taught us. And really for Muslims, there is no better role model than the Prophet Muhammad. He is considered the ideal role model, uh, a sinless and divinely appointed guide for us. And so ideally, our laws go back to him and his sayings, and then we try and understand them and apply them to modern times. Because of course, there was no CPR in the Prophet's time. There was no television or internet. Maybe that was a good thing, but we now have all of these things and we need to incorporate these into our lives because of course we, we live in this time and we believe that Islam is a religion for all time, not just the time of uh, 570 AD. There are two secondary sources. So the primary sources are the Quran and the Sunnah. And if those sources do not clearly give us answers to our questions for our times, then we go back to the secondary approaches which include a consensus of the, of the early scholars, which is rarely applied today, or more practically the last source, which is depending on what school of thought one is in, either a formal body of reasoning um, that is based on, on jurisprudential laws or a similar body that is based on derivation from analogy. So we have aqal and we have qiyas, which are slightly different but that same concept of deriving laws from the original two sources and that's what the major schools of thought will follow. And as you'll see, there are some differences between the schools of thought that become relevant when dealing with bioethics. So a little bit of history then for just two minutes to put things into a broader context. 
like any other religion, whether whether um, whether Judaism, Christianity, etc., Islam is not a monolithic faith. It is a complex faith that spans many countries and many centuries and has multiple sects and schools of thought. The word madhab refers to a school of thought. There are five major ones, but there are a number of other minor ones as well. And while most of these sects do share the same basic principles that I've discussed, as well as the acts of worship, there are some important differences. I'll highlight a couple a little later on that have implications in the world of bioethics and, and may have relevance not only around rituals, but actually around things such as withholding or withdrawing care, definitions of brain death, and other areas that are already value-laden and, and controversial even in, in many secular realms. There are also local cultural factors that exert influence in different countries and different communities that also has to be uh, treaded through carefully. Whether they come from the Quran or the Sunnah or not, they still represent a rich part of people's cultural traditions that they have um, married with the religion. And so one needs to sometimes dissect these out to understand how much of the concerns, for example, with a given patient are really culturally based or go back to the actual original faith. Sometimes that's not easy to do. The major division that occurred within Islam that separated the sects out occurred after the death of the Prophet and really centered around the issue of successorship. And so to try and simplify this, and I, I don't have a pointer here, maybe I can use the mouse. So really after the death of the Prophet, the major issue that divided the Muslim community into two broad areas, and there are some other minor sects that, that are a little more complicated to map, but the two major groups really either were those that believed that there was no divinely appointed successor to the prophet and that the community had to struggle on its own through various means to be able to find the caliphs and the scholars that led that community and that represents about 85 percent of the Muslim community today, including the majority of countries in the Middle East and other Muslim countries. That is the, the Sunni schools of thought, and there are four major schools of thought within Sunni Islam. And then the other major split was among those who believed that there was a divine guide, um, or multiple divine guides that in fact were chosen by God and appointed and announced by the Prophet Muhammad in his lifetime, and that those divine guides are the ones that we look to for, for further guidance, and those are among the sects, or the sects for those at that split would include the Shia Ibn Ashuris, who were the Twelvers, and would include, for example, the Ismaili community as well. And, and even within the Ismailis, there are two communities, as you may know. Uh, the Bahora community recently had their imam uh, pass away a couple of months ago, and they were in the process of appointing their, their next imam. And so the, the Aga Khani Ismailis, the Aga Khan, His Highness was here uh, recently in Canada and was uh, giving lectures and so on. He and the Bahora community and the 12 Shia Ethna Asheris, who, for example, constitute the majority of Iran and the majority of Iraq and so on, they are within the, the Shia school of thought. All the other major countries uh, are following the Sunni schools of thought. And there are some differences between them, as I mentioned, that will become important. Okay, so now I'd like to move on and talk about some of the Islamic ethical principles and then some of the clinical implications of those in the lives of those of us who deal with patients and have to struggle with some of the ethical issues on a day-to-day -day basis. First of all, there are some key principles that guide the subsequent laws and our understanding of how to resolve potential ethical dilemmas and deal with an ethical discourse within an Islamic framework. And so first of all, the, the number one principle is the sanctity of life, and I'll go into each of these in a moment. The second is that there are specific duties and rights with respect to illness for the patient as well as the clinician, and that the concept of suffering has multiple roles and values within Islam, and while there may be bad components to suffering, there may also be some redemptive qualities which I'll touch on. The fourth major issue is that the family unit is the basic building block of a society within an Islamic society, and that has implications for decision-making and autonomy. And then finally, the concept of food and water, which particularly are issues for me to deal with as a geriatrician and Rory to deal with when we're dealing with a lot of individuals with advancing dementia who may have significant issues around nutrition and hydration and what to do. And with an Islamic concept, these are considered to be basic uh, 
human needs rather than medical treatments per se. So, the sanctity of life. There is a famous verse in the Holy Quran that deals with this quite clearly from which many of the laws around death and dying and, and sanctity of life are derived and there are uh, parts of the Sunnah that expand on this. But really, in English, this can be translated as he who slays any one man, it shall be as though he has slain mankind as a whole. And he who saves a human life, it shall be as though he has saved mankind as a whole. And the idea of saving life is not just someone's drowning and you sort of rescue them, but rather the concept of saving life in healthcare. It has been extensively applied in terms of helping prolong life and the save the life of someone who is sick. And so doctors get great blessings uh, if we're able to successfully save life. And indeed, we are, are counted among those who have an easier pathway to heaven than some uh, because of the potential rewards. Um, the flip side, however, is that if we are dangerous to our patients and shorten life, we're doomed. <laughs> so you've got to tread carefully if you want to be a doctor as a, as a Muslim. The overriding principle of the sanctity of life from Islamic decision making is really superseded only in very rare circumstances. So for example, if there is significant corporal punishment that needs to be meted out uh, in the case of, for example, murder that is done willfully, or if there is uh, in certain areas of self-defense or uh, in defense of the religion. But outside of that, the taking of human life is really seen as something that is uh, a terrible disgrace to God and something we have no right to do. And the overriding principle then is to preserve life, whether our own or others, at almost any cost. A corollary to this is really that God is seen as the arbiter of both the beginning and the end of life, and that every moment of life is seen as precious, whether one is conscious or unconscious, and it is an opportunity to continue to engage in the worship of God, whether we are conscious or unconscious. And so the idea, for example, of the unconscious patient having no quality of life and suffering is something that is so difficult for Muslims to understand because the idea of suffering when unconscious or, or what metrics we use to measure suffering are very different within an Islamic framework traditionally than within many secular frameworks. And similar to that, our bodies are seen as a trust from God. He has given them to us in one shape and form and we must try and look after them, cherish them and preserve them as best as we can, recognizing that we're all aging and we can't stop that, and then return those bodies to him when he asks for them. Not before, and certainly not after. Implications of this are a number. The first, of course, is that the Islamic perspective is that life begins at fertilization. Now here, and I'm not going to get into the details because my area is much more the other end of life, not the beginning, that's less interesting, but the concept of where life begins there are differences of opinion among some of the sects as to whether fertilization with sperm and egg forming the zygote is enough or whether you need implantation in a natural lining of the uterus in order to then be considered that first moment of life. So there are some differences which has implications, for example, for certain methods of birth control among the different sects. But in general, life begins at, at fertilization. There is a period of ensoulment, so the concept that when does the soul enter into the body? And based on sayings from the Prophet Muhammad, it is believed that it enters into the body at four months and ten days after fertilization. Not implantation, but after fertilization. But of course, the number of days between fertilization and implantation is generally very few. But four months and ten days is that period of ensoulment. And that becomes important later on, as you'll see in just a moment when we deal with the issue of abortion. And similarly, life ends when God removes the soul from the body, which is wonderful before we had things like CPR and artificial ventilators. But these days, we have not yet invented a soul meter to measure when does that elusive soul extricate itself from the body and we can shut off the machine. And so we're forced to try to extrapolate with modern technology and our, and our limited science of being able to measure the soul to figure that out when we have to deal with the bedside issues, particularly in an ICU setting. And in general, prolonging life takes precedence over the preservation of quality of life. Quality of life is really thought to be a much more secondary phenomenon that really has little role to play in decision making for most Muslim patients and clinicians. But that prolongation of life is not at any cost. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. There are some other factors that must be considered 
but they are much lower in the prioritization than the idea of prolonging life. So what are the implications? Well, let's deal with birth control very briefly. Three major principles around birth control that the vast majority of sects among Muslims have agreed to. First of all, the process cannot be seen as significantly harmful to the mother. And of course, because the means the end does not justify the means, and we need to ensure that the mother, who is fully alive even before any, any child is born, that her health and life must be maintained and preserved. There can be minor risks and minor side effects, but in general, the process should not be harmful. The second is that the stopping of the birth, or the stopping of the process that leads to birth with sperm and egg, etc., must occur prior to that period when life is considered to begin. So whether fertilization or implantation, depending on one sect within Islam. And that finally, the process must be seen as reversible, because whatever changes we do to our body, unless they are for the mother's own health, must be seen as those that are temporary, and the body can be preserved and given back in close to the form that it was given to us. So that has issues around, for example, permanent sterilization, you know, vasectomies, etc., which there are specific rules on, but that's not my focus today. In general, abortion is not considered permissible within Islam, with the exception of saving the life of the mother. Some scholars, depending on the sect and depending on the country, have allowed abortion in a couple of specific circumstances. For example, when there are severe congenital anomalies in the, in the fetus that can be diagnosed with reasonable certainty based on modern technologies, or in the case of rape, but again, one needs to look at the specific sects. And even then, these circumstances are allowed only before ensoulment. Because after ensoulment, the magnitude of the, of the sin or the, or the griev grievousness of the act becomes magnified because now you're not dealing with only potential life, but now you're dealing with an actual ensouled human. The other flip side at the end of life is that suicide is absolutely forbidden in Islam. And, and we could talk about some of the, the implications even for handling the burial of a body of someone who's committed suicide, but we might get into that in question and answer period if people are interested. But active euthanasia similarly is considered to be completely unacceptable. Now, along with the sanctity of life I mentioned, there are some duties, rights, and issues around illness that I want to touch on uh, for a few moments. First of all, when we understand the issue of duties and rights, we all have duties to various uh, spheres of influence in our lives. As Muslims, we have duties to God, we have duties to our fellow human beings, we have duties to the environment, and so on and so forth. As patients, it is our duty to re prevent illness, to engage in reasonable activities that lead to illness prevention, to seek out treatment when we have illness, to preserve life, and to prolong life. And these duties are all implicit within the uh, principles that I've already iterated and, do, and have been explicated by a number of scholars. In one of the famous books of hadith or sayings of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, the Sahih al-Bukhari, there is a saying that God has created a treatment for every illness, which inspires not only us to seek out treatments as patients, but also inspires scientists to continue to do research to find a cure for every ailment. Now, as a geriatrician, there is a reported twist on this saying, uh, another version of this, which is God has created a treatment for every illness except old age. <laughs> so whether this version or the other version is correct, I'm not quite sure. As I get older, I, I may have different thoughts on that, but, but we will see. And there are duties, but they are linked to rights that we also have. And the emphasis in Islam is on duties, but we also have rights. So the patient, for example, has some duties around looking after themselves, as I mentioned, around prevention and, and preventing illness. We have duties to seek out treatment for illness and accept those treatments that are given by a legitimate clinician or health expert to us. And we have the duty to follow the orders of what I put down here as a physician. It's really any clinician, but most of the literature has referred to the doctor, which indeed has a very sacred uh, responsibility within Islam. You also have a right as a patient to be seen by a doctor and to receive advice that is considered to be uh, reasonable on the basis of the best attempts and efforts by that physician and non-coercive and, and non-deceptive, etc. The physician, once they have trained, has a duty to see patients when and where they're able, of course, and they have a duty to try their best to properly diagnose and treat illness. 
which has implications for proper education and training for physicians, not only when they begin their training, but throughout their lives to maintain competence. And it is a great honor and perceived as a great uh, blessing to be able to pass on these skills to future generations because as most of you know, a lot of medicine is still an apprenticeship and we are teaching our apprentices and that act of teaching is considered indeed a great blessing. So lots of opportunities to earn blessings as a, as a Muslim physician, just don't do too much harm to people um, or you're in trouble. So the implications really are that patients need to seek out experts in, in an area when they are ill and then to follow their advice and the tremendous respect and privilege is given to physicians within uh, Muslim societies within the Muslim culture and that one should not refuse treatment if it is offered by a, an expert clinician with knowledge in that area if there is a reasonable likelihood that that treatment will prolong life. However, accepting experimental therapies such as for example experimental chemotherapy in advanced cancer is not mandated because it's considered as experimental. You can choose as long as you know the benefits outweigh the harms but it is not mandated according to the scholars to date. And within most sacred writings and the modern interpretations of those writings by scholars there is far less attention paid to the idea of costs at an individual level or a societal level as well as the concept of suffering and trying to relieve that suffering in comparison to the importance of saving life and prolonging life. Um, so that that discourse is evolving, but much less so than some of the rich traditions, for example, in Catholicism or Judaism or in, in, in secular bioethics. And preventative care, including vaccination, cancer screening, etc., is included within this framework. That need to undergo treatment supersedes virtually every other law in Islam. So for example, a common restriction for Muslims from a dietary perspective is we do not eat of the flesh of swine and we do not drink alcohol. But if those things must be done in order to save life, then they must be done because life trumps those other secondary rules. So that's just an example. So for those who can't read the bottom, this says, no, I'm not the grim reaper anymore. I prefer to be known as an end of life provider. <laughs> so, so that's a little bit tongue in cheek, but that gets into some of the issues around end of life care. So, while we recognize as Muslims and as, as Muslim clinicians that life is precious regardless of the perceived level of awareness of the patient or around the concept of quality of life, at the same time, while the general rule is to continue treatment if there's a chance of prolonging life, we understand that there are limits to this care. And while general treatment includes, for example, ICU care such as intubation, mechanical ventilation, dialysis machines, and so on, there are some limitations. In general, the scholars talk about trying to differentiate those conditions that are thought to be reversible and have a reasonable chance of being treated and prolonging life, and they do not give a quantitative estimate to what is reasonable, whether it's 5% or 95% or in the middle. That is left to the patient, the scholar, and the doctor to come to an understanding, which does lead to some challenges. On the other hand, if the condition is thought to be part of an irreversible disease or condition that is not going to be curable or life cannot be prolonged in a meaningful way because we have no treatments that will deal with the underlying disease, then treatment is not mandated. And the common example I give when dealing with, with uh, clinical audiences is if you imagine someone with advanced lung cancer and they come into a hospital with acute respiratory distress and they, they are dying and unless we instigate aggressive measures in an intensive care unit that patient is going to die very soon. Now if the, if the cause of their acute respiratory distress is progressive lung cancer that is spread widely throughout the lungs we don't have to put them on a ventilator. We don't have to do CPR and so on because we're really dealing with prolonging a dying process from a disease that cannot be cured. On the other hand if they come in with a rapidly progressive pneumonia where there's a reasonable likelihood that with antibiotics and aggressive care in the ICU, they will turn around with treatment and be able to survive, then we are obligated to treat them. And so that's a distinction that is sometimes easier to say at the lectern, sometimes harder at the bedside, but that's part of the challenge that we all have, no matter what tradition we come from when dealing with the practicalities of day-to-day -day, um, patient care. Around CPR and DNR, CPR is generally encouraged, again, if the active health issues that the patient has prior to the event that leads to the need for CPR are conditions that are potentially reversible 
or not end stage. But on the other hand, if we are dealing with progression of a, of a terminal disease for which there is really no reasonable likelihood of cure or meaningful prolongation of life, then CPR is not mandated and the DNR is a very reasonable thing to be able to agree to. Now, here is where the sectarian differences become a little bit complicated. The vast majority of Sunni jurists have allowed withdrawing of care in a situation where one has begun a course of life-sustaining therapy, for example, a mechanical ventilator in an intensive care unit. If there is no hope of recovery that is considered based on the expert opinion by a physician after undergoing a reasonable round of treatment, then most Sunni jurists will allow withdrawing of therapy and consider that to be morally justifiable. However, Shia jurists will not allow that. And almost every Shia jurist to date has said that withholding and withdrawing therapy are not considered morally equivalent. Withholding in the first place is morally permissible based on the circumstances I described earlier, whereas withdrawing of care is tantamount to murder. And the physician who orders that or agrees to that is going to get the punishments of, of uh, the Holy Quran, number five, uh, chapter 5, verse 32, uh, which is the burden of having slain humanity. So a very serious issue for, for Shia doctors. And the other day I was dealing with a, uh, a Shia Muslim respiratory therapist who wanders on the ICU and has to unplug people when the doctors write the orders. And she was asking, can I do that because I'm not writing the order and the patient doesn't want it anymore or the family, their proxies, or will God see me as a murderer every time I do it? So um, some tough issues sometimes for those. The other area that's interesting around death is the concept of brain death, which some of you are very familiar with, and I won't go into the definitions because of lack of time. But Sunni jurists, almost every one of them, in a major consensus conference a number of years ago um, in one of the Islamic ethics uh, symposia, have all accepted brain death as an acceptable criterion for death. The majority of Shia jurists uh, have not. And so again, a distinction. So if any of you are actually providing ethical advice to Muslim patients, it, it behooves us around these circumstances to understand what's their school of thought and how closely are they following that school of thought, because the advice may end up becoming very different, which is, of course, why we really want to involve a local imam that is hopefully of the same sect as the patient and family and doesn't give them um, conflicting advice, which sometimes happens in smaller communities when you don't have that choice. Now, what about suffering? So I've alluded to this a little bit already, but suffering can be seen in a couple of ways from an Islamic perspective. And generally, suffering is not seen as a punishment for, for crimes that people may have committed. It is often seen as a trial or a test from God. For example, think of Prophet Job. The same uh, stories come in Quran as they do in the, in the Bible. Suffering may be a way of expiating one's sins because God has told us that every sin that we do in this life will be punished or forgiven in this life or punished in the barzakh, which is similar to your purg purgatory of, of Catholic tradition, as far as I understand purgatory. But by the end of that, before the Day of Judgment, every sin must be accounted for in some way, shape, or form. And so suffering in this life may, in fact, be a way of expiating some of those sins. And so some patients may react very positively to developing illness because they want that illness because there are sayings from the Prophet that illness is a time when we remember God and when our sins get washed away if we react with patience and perseverance and are thankful to God rather than, oh, why am I dealing with this illness? Um, so if we have the right perspectives, sin, uh, sickness is indeed a blessing at times. And finally, although suffering may not necessarily be perceived as bad, that does not mean that physicians should merely walk away and say, oh, well, you're suffering, that's okay, you, you know, you'll get some blessings out of it. It is our duty and our right to try to help relieve suffering as best we can. Because if God doesn't want it, we're not going to be able to do it. But we are encouraged, for example, to help relieve pain and distress and so on, and that, that's absolutely encouraged to try to help someone in distress. So all human beings, according to the Quran, are going to be tried with one of three things in our lives, um, either loss of health, loss of wealth, and or loss of family. Now I should clarify that. They will be tried with all three of these things before we die, not just any one of them. And I'm not going to go into the details uh, just to move things along, but there are reasons why suffering may be seen as a, as a trial. Suffering may also expiate sins, as I mentioned, uh, as I briefly talked about, and that not all suffering is, is necessarily bad, 
but at the same time we can uh, try and help relieve that, that suffering. And I'm just going to move along because I know I'm almost out of time and I want to get through a couple of other things. So the implications of this idea of suffering, there's a couple of times when I've seen this come around and certainly described in the literature. Sometimes Muslim patients or family members may have an incorrect view that their loved one is dealing with an illness that is there because they are spiritually weak and they are deserving of this, this terrible punishment. And, you know, in the old days when, when AIDS first reared its ugly head, um, there were a number of scholars within Muslim tradition, unfortunately, who said, oh, this is a plague from God uh, on humanity and, and so on. And, and most of us don't, don't believe that. And certainly these days uh, we, we have a much, I think, more rational view of HIV like many other infections. But it's not seen in, in the majority of scholarly opinions within Islam as a punishment from God in the majority of circumstances. There are some exceptions in, described in, in the Quran and, and in other holy books in terms of some of the inflictions of, on, in the past, but not in modern times as we understand. Another important corollary is that most Muslims, when they are dealing with suffering, will turn to the Quran and with various supplications in order to try to help them be patient and have forbearance at the time of suffering. And they will welcome having local imams or other religious authorities visit with them and pray with them and so on. Most are comfortable with non-denominational chaplains, but they don't feel that same bond or connection with them because the, the supplications and the, and the blessings are seen as best when coming straight from the traditions of the Prophet and from the Quran. And Muslim patients, however, are rarely uncomfortable with aiming for relief of, of symptoms uh, with modern medical therapy. But sometimes, I've had some patients who become very fatalistic, um, and it's difficult sometimes to rationalize with them, even with the help of the local imam who says, you can seek out treatment for this illness. You shouldn't just say, it's all in God's hands, inshallah, type of thing, and whatever will happen will happen. There are some who it, it's hard to convince, but that's not seen as a conventional Islamic opinion, but rather uh, a very small minority opinion or misunderstanding. Sometimes, however, I have seen some Muslim patients who will try and reduce the level of pain medications they get in order to preserve awareness and consciousness so they can pray to God and be more aware. And that's seen in multiple faith traditions. I see people nodding their heads. It's not uncommon. I want to touch briefly on, on a couple of other things, and I think I won't have time to get into death rituals. I'll have to stop. Um, really? I, I don't want to keep people. I know everyone's important. but Well, I can keep going all night, so, so don't, don't encourage me. You might not like it. Okay. The concept of the family, when one looks at the laws and the rationale behind the religion from an Islamic perspective, when I teach this in Sunday school, the basic building block of a Muslim society is the family. And many of the restrictions on individual freedom, for example, a common one that, that we see is the idea of, of the hijab, you know, the women who are wearing the veil. And by the way, hijab is not just the woman wearing the veil. Hijab applies to men, hijab applies to women. There are three parts to it. But the veil is the only part we easily see. Um, and so that's the part we focus in on. Um, but that's not the only part. But the concept of, for example, the hijab, it violates or it, it suppresses individual freedoms because the needs of the society are seen as primal over and above the needs of the individual. And that there are protections that that hijab brings not only to the man and the woman, but to the morals of society, for example. Or why certain laws and rules are enacted, because the society and the family unit is indeed that primal unit, which is why there are some very strong rules around marriage and divorce and, and raising of children, etc. The clinical implications in modern healthcare are that autonomy is really not a big issue within Islamic tradition. And yes, individuals have a right to say yes and no. There's no question. The Quran ensconces it from the beginning of religion. It says so in, in chapter 2, um, verse number 255, there is no compulsion in religion. You can't force people to accept religion, to accept prayer, or to accept the ventilator. Any of these people have rights, and they can choose. In most Muslim societies, because people operate within families, People, patients often aren't making their own decisions. They're done in consultation, or they're done deferring to the patriarch of the family, or sometimes the matriarch, but usually the patriarch. And sometimes we, within secular paradigms, have a little bit of discomfort with that when we're asking the patient, and they keep looking to someone else, and like, ask them. They're making the decisions. But in fact, most of them voluntarily and consciously make that choice. But of course, we still have to determine and make sure that people are not being coerced into doing something they don't want to. So sometimes that creates a bit of a struggle 
Um, I've seen it actually, for example, um, one of my patients, the most striking example is Je uh, Jehovah's Witness patient, um, who, of course, refused blood transfusions, and her mother refused blood transfusions when the, when the local members of the, of the Watchtower Society were there. And when they left and we were able to interview them in private, they said, yes, give the transfusion, just don't tell them. And, you know, I mean, it sounds a bit comical, but it, they're clearly torn. And similarly, Muslims, when, when dealing with their family members, may say, oh, yes, yes, ask father, ask whoever. Um, I, although I don't like saying this, I think it still behooves us to try and at least have a simple private discussion with them to make sure that that's really what they want and that they are actively passing on that, uh, that decision-making to that other person. But you will see that a lot, particularly with husbands for wives and, and fathers in, in larger families, particularly among more recent immigrants. It is not, however, a religious requirement. It's quite clear that the woman or the man has a right to make their own decisions. And so there should be no issue that somebody else has the absolute right to make a choice for someone else. There's no justification within Islamic law for that. It's, however, very common within, within the culture of most of these Muslim countries. So we need to be aware of that fine line. And it's obviously, there are other cultural nuances in many of the, the groups I'm sure you've interacted with. And so often, a male family member will expect to be present and involved in decision-making for all aspects of health care for a competent adult woman. Sometimes it gets very tricky when dealing with, with sensitive issues. Um, the other implication around family, and there's a number of other ones around adoption and abortion and family planning, but surrogate parenthood is not allowed in Islam, and there are some very specific rules around when in vitro fertilization is allowed. And the vast majority of scholars have allowed it, if at all, only when the sperm and the egg are from the father and mother who are married, and, and that's where the zygote will be hosted. There are some minority opinions that allow a surrogate mother, but they are among a very small minority among the jurists at the present time. Now, nutrition and hydration. This is another area of some contention. And as I mentioned to you, within the Islamic tradition, and, and there's a number of verses on this, and I've written a, a, an article on this arguing the, the position in detail, if you're interested, I've cited it here. But the Islamic perception is that we have a sacred duty to provide nutrition and hydration to all individuals, regardless of their age or illness or ethnicity, etc., and that these are considered basic aspects of care rather than medical treatment per se. And that has implications because most families, when dealing with a loved one who is dying, will insist on continuing oral fluids, intravenous fluids, or even things via nasogastric tube or, or gastrostomy or feeding tubes um, until the time of death and will not want to stop that because they will see that as violating the basic care that they are obligated to provide to their loved one. Ideally, they would do it with hand-based feeding and preparing the meals and, and all of that because that's all part of that support of family, support of our elders, etc. But when they cannot, the translation of that is that it should be done through intravenouses and feeding tubes and so on, unless it is considered harmful to life. So the most common circumstance where I will be involved in negotiations between the, the families and the ICU or the medical teams is when the patient's getting IV fluids, the family wants them to continue, but the doctors say, you know what, this is leading to fluid overload, congestive heart failure, and when you rationalize that with the family and explain it, they completely understand and they will stop the fluids. Ideally, they will say, let's give the minimum amount of fluid we can so that we're giving something that is still safe and not going to exacerbate their heart condition, etc. But sometimes that means no fluid, and that's understandable. Similarly, a common circumstance would be you do not give food either via feeding tube or, or by mouth if it's going to lead to a high likelihood of aspiration, pneumonitis, pneumonia, and potential death. And I've had some times where we've had to stop feeds in, in some of my uh, Muslim patients because of that. And they understand that as long as one is clear on the reasoning rather than, oh, it's going to cause terrible suffering and, and sort of couching it, oh, it's not going to lead to quality of life, that really irks many families. And it's like, well, how do you know what's their suffering or their quality of life? And, and that's obviously a very challenging question no matter what one's uh, cultural or religious background is. I will emphasize a couple of key things before I, I ask again for permission to talk about death and dying. I, I, I don't want to try the audience too much. We cannot force people to do things against their wishes, as I mentioned, and we must be very clear on that, even when people may try and convince you otherwise. 
the idea of disclosure and truth telling is something that is highly encouraged within islam and many times you'll read in these ethical case reports the family says don't tell so and so that they have whatever it'll kill them there's no religious basis for that and i'm sure we've seen it in multiple cultures and multiple groups and I've actually never seen anyone die when I tell them the news. So uh, I don't know if that's true, but people sometimes very strongly believe it. In my experience, I don't know about Rory and some of the other clinicians in the room, patients usually know. By the time you tell them, it's like, well, thanks for bringing it out in the open. Now we can talk about it. And the family is aghast that the patient actually had a clue that they have advanced cancer, for example, and everyone's beating around the bush and saying, you're getting antibiotics for some growth or whatever they say. And so you can usually get around it, but sometimes it becomes tricky. But there's no religious reason to withhold the truth. And in fact, it's encouraged to give them the truth as much as they want to know. Sometimes they may not want to know, and they may defer again to family members. And that's their choice as long as they're, they're competent, of course. And finally, we do not have any intrinsic opposition from an Islamic scholarly perspective to the idea of living wills, advanced directives. A number of Muslim countries have enacted them. The challenge comes when the advanced directive asks a Muslim doctor or a Muslim family member to do something that is against Islam just because the patient wanted it. And then, of course, you're in a bit of an ethical bind uh, in terms of what to do um, and, and whose priorities do you take. So for those of you who do not know, there is no formal clergy within Islam and that you have a variety of local imams and scholars that can be very helpful to patients and families. But I will give a word of warning. Not every scholar is of the same sect as the patient and family. More importantly, not every scholar is versed in Islamic bioethics. And some of them will actually say things that are wrong, unfortunately. And I mean, don't disrespect to them, but I have had experiences where sort of local imams who have not undergone formal training, have not gone to one of the, the scholarly schools in the Middle East and have not studied Islam in, in perhaps as much depth in these areas as others, and they will issue opinions uh, that actually go against the majority opinions of the fatwas of their own school of thought. Um, and then it becomes very awkward when I have to try to point that out, and it's like, well, I'm not your imam, I'm not a mufti, but, but sometimes we've had that. So one has to be careful who one picks as the, local, as the imam for the patient and family. Most of the time they have their own representatives from their own mosques who will, who will try and come, and hopefully they will be helpful. Sometimes they may be a hindrance. Usually they're helpful, inshallah as we say. And there's a lot more heterogeneity and informal scholarship among the, the scholars within Sunni Islam, whereas in Shia Islam, particularly among the, the, the Ismailis, but as well among the, the Ithna Ashris, the Twelvers, there is a formal jurist that that patient and family, if they are Shia and observant, will follow. So for example, if you are a follower of the Ayatollah Sistani in Iraq, then you will follow his rulings his traditions, and if there is a clarification on an issue, issue such as brain death, withholding of care, you will consult that scholar, not Ayatollah Khamenei in Iran or Ayatollah whoever in another country. You will consult your own jurist. And so in, within Shia traditions, it's much more um, clear in terms of the line of reasoning and who you have to go back to. And even if you find, for example, a local imam from a Shia mosque, they will clarify with the patient and the family who is their jurist, and they will give opinions or seek opinions from the representatives of that direct jurist, because there are some differences even among the jurists. More differences between Shia and Sunni, but sometimes even within Shia there are, there are differences. Uh, for those who can't read this, it says, you scared him to death, and I'm sorry, the bang is, is hard to visualize. I tried to fiddle with the slides. Um, see, it just was a bad joke. All right, I'll try another one next time. Do I have time to talk about it? Really? Do I have the, the, the permission of the audience? All right, I'll, I'll try and do this shortly, but... I wanted to provide a little insight into Islamic perspectives around death and dying, not from the ethics side, but rather from the concept of spirituality and rituals, because many of you may face dying patients and their families and having a little more awareness of what they're doing. So as I mentioned, we have a very strong belief in the afterlife, as well as a day of judgment where we will be held to account for everything we have done uh, in our lives. And at the time of death, the soul is thought to exit the body with the assistance from the angel of death. Um, that passage or transition of the soul out of the body will be seen as minimally uncomfortable or very smooth in those who have lived a virtuous life. 
But for those who are sinners or perceive themselves as sinners, they may have a terrible fear of facing death, even if they believe in God, because they feel that that death and the afterlife will be, will be a significant source of potential discomfort and suffering for them. And this is where having the, the imam try to provide some spiritual counsel and, and helping them to seek forgiveness and understanding atonement and so on will be helpful. But that transition is seen as potentially a very um, threatening time to, to personal suffering. And, and not physical suffering, but spiritual suffering, obviously. Death is seen as the beginning of a journey towards meeting the, the Creator and getting closer to God, although obviously we believe God is everywhere. This life is seen as a very transient abode, and that really the afterlife is the main place. But there are two transitions after this life. I'll come back to that in a second. Another key point is that until the body is buried in the ground or in the sea, if there's a death at sea, the soul cannot be at rest and the soul will not leave the body. The soul continues to feel the torments of the body until the burial happens. And so this is important because the soul can not directly interact with people, but the soul is aware of things around them, including if people start saying bad things about family members and so on, they can feel that distress. But more importantly, um, the last point on this slide is that there are sayings from the prophet that suggest that the soul will feel the pain of the body magnified a thousandfold. And so then the families try to be extremely careful with any handling of the body, which, not to say the doctors and nurses are rough, but after death we don't have that same sensitivity generally, but for the Muslim families they become extremely concerned when the body gets turned or things get pulled out and, and so on, IVs, etc. So um, it's a huge issue. And that's why they try and rush the burial in order to facilitate the soul getting released from the body and being at rest. Ideally, same-day burials are highly encouraged, not mandated, but highly encouraged, and almost any Muslim family will not want the body to go to the morgue, not because they're terrified of the morgue, but it delays the process of, of burial. Most religious communities within the Islamic tradition in the GTA will have a burial committee at the mosque who will then expedite getting the body straight to the graveyard, if, of course, there's no issue with coroners and autopsies and so on which of course autopsies are not generally allowed in Islam. But I think I have a point on that uh, in a moment. After death, a couple of things are encouraged that in order to prepare for the best burial for the body, the eyes are then closed, the body should be appropriately shrouded and covered, um, and the arms and legs are straightened and the chin is brought up to the mouth and often tied with a simple cloth uh, that's almost like a scarf over the head in order to let the body, when it gets rigor mortis, in order to have the, the chin closed because the body, the mouth should not be open at the time of burial. And so these simple traditions are, are done. Prior to the burial, actually, I think I missed a point around the, I'm sorry, yes. So, um, did I skip that? My apologies, I, I think I skipped a slide here. So, the transition of death is tried, to be, is tried to be made as comfortable as possible by the family, which includes a couple of key things. The body is never to be left alone wherever possible. The verses of the Qur'an or supplications are recited constantly without disrupting care, of course, um, but at all times in order to bring blessings to the, to the patient and to the loved ones around them. They all get blessings when visiting sick people. You'll notice in many Muslim cultures you have large gatherings of people coming around the time when people are, are dying or very sick because there are, there's a saying from the Prophet Muhammad that if you visit someone who is sick or dying, then God will appoint a number of angels for you who will pray from dawn to dusk if you visit in the day or from dusk to dawn if you visit at night, even if you visit for only a minute. And so visiting the sick is highly encouraged for your own salvation as well as helping comfort the person who, who's dying. And there are a series of recommendations on what to say and what to do when visiting someone who's sick and dying, but that I won't get into. Another key point around positioning the body is that whenever we pray, we pray towards the Kaaba, which is the, the holy shrine for all Muslims in Mecca, approximate cardinal direction of east, northeast from Toronto, but when someone is dying or they've passed away, they will try and position the body such that the feet are facing towards the Kaaba as well, and will often move beds around in the ICU or on the floors where possible. Some things can't be done because of, of technological limitations, but you'll see that's why they request to, to do that move.
where possible. I talked about this. So prior to the burial, the body will be taken and there is a special ceremonial washing that will be done uh, with three special washes and special types of, of ceremonial water and, and perfumes that are put on the body and a special white cloth, a simple white cloth uh, is shrouding the body. In fact, it's recommended to purchase that cloth before you die and have your own personalized burial cloth. It's considered one of those things that, that fulfills one of those major duties of a Muslim in preparation for death. And so sometimes you'll see people asking for, bring me my burial cloth, and, and we might be aghast, and oh my God, they're so fatalistic, but it's to prepare and make sure that they get buried in the cloth of their choice, more blessings to them, and, and often those cloths are inscribed uh, with special supplications to help uh, protect them and, and seek forgiveness from God. Cremation is absolutely not permissible within Islamic tradition, and if the pain of the body is magnified a thousandfold, you can imagine the horrors of the soul having to suffer when the body is, uh, is burned. There are some people who choose to, who are Muslims, but, in, but within Islamic tradition it is, it is absolutely not accepted by any of the scholars and any of the sects that I'm aware of. Autopsy is generally forbidden. The two exceptions are if there are judicial investigations, coroner's office, etc., that's fine. The other major circumstance is if the life of another person can be saved, such as, for example, organ transplantation or investigating the outbreak of a new emerging illness, etc., then autopsy uh, may be permissible, but obviously to the limited extent as possible in order to reduce the suffering to the body. There are some differences of opinion among the different scholars and sects within Islam as to what organs can be transplanted or when, um, and how immediate that saving of life can be or should be. However, to donate a body to science, for example, to medical science, like they, people did when I was in medical school and people were donating their bodies, is not allowed because it's not seen as having a high likelihood of saving life directly. There are some special congregational prayers that get recited prior to the actual burial, and the grieving and, and shedding of tears is welcome among the, the, the men and women. There are, again, a number of traditions around that. The official mourning period after death is, is recommended for three days, during which time lots of family members will visit, non-family members, friends, clinicians are encouraged and allowed to, to go and visit uh, family members. During those times it's recommended to bring food. The family is not supposed to worry about mundane things like cooking for themselves for those three days when they are immersed in grief. They can obviously continue to grieve after, but those three days are, are a critical period of, of the official grieving process. And, and many times you'll see families start wanting to donate goods, donate to charity and so on because the blessings from the donations can help to wipe out sins um, during that short period after death uh, before the body is uh, laid to rest and the soul separates. So it's highly encouraged to donate to charity at that time. Okay. I'm going to summarize. I'm done now almost. Okay, two last slides I think. Um, I'm not going to summarize saying everything I've already said but rather to contrast with... Um, two major faith traditions and with modern secular ethics. So many of you are familiar with Beauchamp's um, four sort of principles for modern secular ethics and I know we don't all agree with them and there are a number of critiques of these but nevertheless beneficence as we understand it, the idea of doing good is a major goal within Islamic tradition as well if one maps Islamic ethics into, into secular bioethics but there are some clear religious perspectives on what is good and the idea of quality of life and avoiding suffering are, are really low priority compared to good being preservation and prolongation of life primarily over and above anything else. Non-maleficence or first doing no harm is really the counterpart to beneficence and here the Islamic tradition would say we must be very careful to do our utmost not to shorten uh, life for those people who are ill or, or dying. Autonomy as I mentioned earlier has a much smaller role within Islam although it is certainly allowed and, and, and permissible, but rarely in a Muslim country, for example, would a doctor ask a patient, well, you have pneumonia, would you like antibiotics? Or, you know, you have this condition, tell me, it's like, is this going to help me? The doctor recommends it, the patient does it. The idea of autonomy, yes, you can ask them, but so much it's, you're the expert, I've come to you, heal me. Uh, that, that's a much more common tradition within our cultures, both in, in uh, Muslim countries and, and in the West, among more traditional Muslim communities. And finally, the idea of justice, whether distributive or individual justice, is a much lower importance within traditional Islamic scholarly work uh, at the present time, particularly level of the individual. That being said, there are a growing number of 
fatwas or religious rulings around, for example, you have two sick people and only one ICU bed, and how do you decide? So there is awareness because we have finite resources, and of course it affects not just us in the West, but in every country because no country has an infinite number of beds. And so these issues are starting to come up, but there's much less formal discourse within the writings compared to within secular ethics or even Catholic or some other tradition. And the final summary, this is from uh, one of our articles uh, where my colleagues and I compared and contrast to Judaism, Catholicism, and Islam. And I'll just point out that Islam and Judaism, for example, share an awful lot in common, as does Islam with Catholicism, but the Judaism and Islam have, uh, are almost identical in virtually uh, every major area, other than a few very subtle distinctions around, for example, the concept of seeking a second religious opinion from a rabbi. Um, that concept doesn't exist within Islam. And a lot of the traditions, as you've already appreciated, many of you have an awareness of Catholic bioethics, they are very similar to Catholic tradition, although there are some important differences, for example, around uh, withdrawing of care and how does one contextualize artificial versus natural nutrition and hydration, or ordinary versus extraordinary means, etc. Um, but I just highlight that briefly, and I won't go into that in any more detail. I have some references here that I've listed for those who um, want to uh, look some of these things up, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, so, well, they better, because otherwise it's pretty hypocritical. So the, the question was, do they accept organs? So within Islamic tradition, we must do virtually anything we can to prolong life and preserve life. And if that means, for example, organ transplantation, then absolutely it is allowed, and every major sect has allowed organ transplantation. The only areas where there is some disagreement, and, and it doesn't happen in reality anyways, is a brain, because of concerns about who exactly are you transplanting, and we don't transplant brains, although we do transplant brain cells from, in, in, you know, for Parkinson's, etc. cetera, and, and um, the, the sex organs of, of a male or female in case that then changes around issues of, of parenthood later on. Outside of that, any other organ, whether it's blood or bone marrow or a heart or a lung, and so on, absolutely it is permissible. And the majority of sects within Islam have also permitted donation of organs, to other people, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, whether you are alive when you're donating or you are dead. Um, but as I say, there are some specific differences among the sects. But absolutely, organ donation is generally um, allowed. In fact, it is encouraged because you may be saving a life. And if you save a life, you know the blessings. Chapter, chapter 5, verse number 32. Um, and, in, and receiving an organ is similarly considered something that, in fact, in some circumstances, you must do if it's available and it's going to prolong and preserve your life. Yes? I assume Or fell and had a hip fracture with a 25% one in the elderly. But no, so trans. So the it, it's been actually raised in some in some of the uh, the conversations I've had in, in presentations with Muslims is what exactly constitutes prolongation of life and must it be just an absolute life expectancy? So the majority of scholarly opinion includes those things that will bring better health or will help to relieve suffering or illness, even if it doesn't necessarily lead to prolongation of life. However, under circumstances where you are relieving other forms of distress or, or improving health, it is not mandatory, but it is certainly allowed. And corneal transplantation has been done in many Muslim countries and is absolutely allowed uh, by, the, by the majority of the scholars. There's been no, I have seen no writings or fatwas that have banned it or even put any hesitation on, on allowing it. Absolutely, there are eye banks in a number of Muslim countries as well. I think there's a question at the back, yes. Yeah, no issues in terms of accepting uh, bone or bone marrow. There's no issues even accepting bone from uh, animals, for example, that one would otherwise consider ritually impure, such as a, a pig, that because we, you know, we do not eat of the flesh of swine. But if you need it for, for preservation of life, prolongation of life, or significant improvement in health, absolutely it's allowed. So pig valves in the heart, uh, bone from, from pig or, or cow sources, although cows are allowed, those sorts of things, no issues, uh, no problems. 
as long as the health benefits outweigh the risks of harm is, is really the main um, dictum there. Other question? Yes, sir. So it's a good question, and in general, the expectation from the scholars that have written in, in Muslim countries is that the government of those countries or Islamic governments or governments that are trying to be moral should be encouraging prolongation of life, not forcing it, but certainly should be encouraging it. And, and the idea of assisted suicide is something that is not uh, discussed, I shouldn't say not discussed, it is something that is considered forbidden within Islam because the person who is committing suicide is basically excused themselves from being considered a believer in Islam anymore. They, they have basically violated uh, major traditions and have, and have, it's a major insult to God and the person assisting is considered a murderer within Islamic tradition. So assisted suicide would be something that would be considered absolutely forbidden within uh, Islamic traditions. Other questions? Yes, at the back, sir. So I'll, I'll clarify both then, thank you. So the tradition around ensoulment is directly actually from a tradition, uh, a saying from the Holy Prophet that ensoulment takes place at four months and ten days. It's a very clear uh, saying of his right out of the, the, the major books of the, of the scholars of hadith uh, or the Sunnah tradition. So that's quite clear that it's come straight from, from a saying from the Prophet and, and so we consider that um, because any words that he said within his lifetime as the prophet of God were considered words that were protected by God and, and done um, in, in a sinless fashion. So there's no error in those words. So if those are the words and they're recorded to the best of our understanding, that's when ensoulment takes place. That's, that's where that belief comes from. The issue of the soul leaving the body is a much trickier one. Until the 1950s, it was very easy because the body stopped bleeding, the heart stopped beating, um, the soul left the body and everybody thought it was fine and dandy and easy. And since we brought in all these convoluted new scientific technologies, the Muslim scholars have struggled with that question and there is no simple answer because of course if we could measure when the soul leaves the body, that would make everything so much easier. But we cannot and so we must try and find ways to understand when has the person actually died and the soul can leave the body. The conventional old definition of rigor mortis, the heart stops, the lung stops, that still happens sometimes and people die and that's still the easy way. The problem is deaths in ICUs, deaths in medical wards, when sometimes, sometimes things become much more complicated. And this is where the soul will not leave the body until after the person dies and is buried. So the soul will separate from the body at the time of death. The soul, however, will hover around that body, even though it's not inhabiting the body, and it will still have a connection to the body, and you will be, be feeling the pain of the body magnified until after the body is buried, and then the soul actually departs from the body at that stage. In some traditions, three days later. In some traditions, shortly after the actual burial of the body. So that there's two parts that, that, that maybe I confuse people with. There's when the soul actually separates from the body, but there's still a connection. And then once the burial takes place within a short time after, hours to maximum three days, the soul will then leave the body permanently and have no further connection with the body. The challenge in practice is, of course, figuring out when has a person died. And this is why we have these traditions from the different scholars and the sects to understand what are the limits of care. Even if we, for example, say the person is brain dead and we accept that, for example, the Sunni majority, all the jurists have accepted that, at that stage when that person is dead, then all care can be withdrawn 
the body, however, is generally not buried within Muslim societies until after the heart stops and the lungs stop breathing after the pulling out of the organs, uh, sorry, after the pulling out of the tubes and other devices that are keeping the body alive. Because if there's brain death, of course, there will not be independent heart and, and lung activity for more than a few seconds or minutes after you disconnect them. So the soul is thought to then leave the body and the death is thought to occur even at the time of brain death, but they'll still wait for the heart and lungs to stop, which usually is only seconds after, in order to then proceed with the burial. I think there was another question. Um, yes, sir. Can you give us a snapshot of the current discussion among Canadian Muslims physicians around palliation? So palliative care is an area that is I think still somewhat misunderstood within traditional Muslim communities when looking at palliative care referrals and, and palliative care doctors. And, and I'm assuming that you mean palliative care in terms of end of life care rather than focusing on, for example, treatment of dyspnea and, and so on, which is an important part of palliative care but a different issue. When dealing with end of life care, Muslims are allowed to accept palliative care. Muslims are allowed to accept pain medications to relieve pain and other medications to help relieve suffering. Muslims are allowed to accept DNR as long as we're dealing with a condition that is felt to be a, a progressive terminal illness for which there is no reasonable cure or likelihood of being able to prolong life in, in, in a meaningful way. So whether it's cancer or non-cancer, you can certainly in people who are in that circumstance accepting palliative care, going to a palliative care facility, accepting DNR, accepting pain medications, all of those are permissible and in fact encouraged if that's going to help relieve distress and physical suffering of, the, of that individual and that, and that patients are allowed to accept it. I had a discussion a couple of months ago with a patient in one of the hospitals in, uh, in the GTA and their family was asking, there's a palliative care team that's come by, can we accept palliative care? It's like, of course we can, provided these circumstances are met. Sometimes people seem very concerned and suspicious towards palliative care that they're going to do something active that's going to lead to euthanasia or assisted suicide and that's obviously not the role of the vast majority of palliative care. The other circumstance where we sometimes have difficulty, and this, this gets very intricate and you really need to do it on a case-by-case -case basis, is for example, continuation of potential life prolonging, well, maybe not life prolonging, let's say continuation of treatments that may be perceived by some as, as prolonging life or improving life. So a common scenario comes in people who need weekly blood transfusions because of some bone marrow disorder. And if you stop the, the blood transfusion, they're not going to die immediately but they will become progressively more anemic and that may contribute to their death. And then it becomes a very difficult circumstance to say, well, does stopping the, blood, the continuing blood transfusions, does that accelerate death? Are we withholding you know, potential life? And that's where you really need a case-by-case -case discussion with a scholar and, and going through the specific diseases and, and conditions. But that's where sometimes the issue of palliative care and what is allowed in a palliative care hospital and what is not, that sometimes becomes the crux of the, of the argument. But generally, it's not it's not seen as neutral. I'm sorry, you I think you had a follow up on that. Sorry, yes. Um, I think you uh, uh, feel from a Muslim perspective that one can legitimately ramp up uh, pain medication, even though they have presented a substantial health report of how shortening the life expectancy is long. Is there, is there debate around that? Or there is very little debate around that. There's been some discussions. The I mean, there's principles of of intended effect and so on, and within other traditions and. Mo the, I have not seen any dissenting opinion from the scholars. In general, when they've issued an opinion, it has been very similar to the issue of, 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 of intended effect and that if the intention is to relieve pain and suffering, but if there is an unacceptable, if there is an unintended consequence of that, that there may be a, a, a hastening of, of death that is still considered acceptable depending on one's intention, if the intentions are correct and, and that is permissible, the majority of scholars have allowed that. Some patients and families are not comfortable with it, but there has, I have not seen any scholarly opinion that says, no, you cannot accept that uh, at this point in time. I th I'm sorry, I think uh, this lady had a question. Oh, okay. Related to palliative care for suffering, I'm, um, I think I've answered this, but it was related to whether the soul is ever deemed to re-enter the body. Would the question be then, was it ever left? Yeah, so the, I actually had this discussion with my Sunday school kids on the weekend. It's like, well, what if someone dies for four minutes 
and then they resuscitate them and bring them back, and then the soul leaves the body, they come back, do they die and come back to life? You know, did God re allow the resurrection? Did the doctors do a miracle, etc.? And it's like, well, I don't know. We, 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 we don't know all this, but the general thought there is that they may have had transient cessation of breathing and, and heart function, but they did not die according to the criteria of, of, of an Islamic death. And maybe that's just semantics, but they may, they may have been so critically ill that their organ system ceased for a period of time where if nothing were done, then they, they would have gone on to that, but they had not reached that threshold where they have died. Uh, because if they have died and the soul has left after death, it will not come back. There is no resurrection, unless God chooses miracle. We believe in miracles, we believe in resurrections, and so on. Uh, I just haven't seen too many resurrection type miracles in my lifetime. I've seen thousands of miracles, but not the resurrection type. To answer the question in a slightly different way, not to be tongue in cheek, but in fact, the soul leaves the body every night. There, there are traditions from the prophet that say that whenever you go to sleep, the soul leaves the body temporarily and there's a term that's used that's it's similar to a type of temporary death. And then when you wake up in the morning, the soul comes back and you, and you are alive again. And there are reasons on, on religious and spiritual level why that's mentioned, but it's, it, it's sort of the idea that the soul may not always be within the body at all times of the day and night, that there may be times when you are asleep at night that the soul separate from the body, but that separation and that connection is different than after death. And it's that temporary versus permanent. Maybe I've, I've opened up a can of worms, but... Yeah, no, absolutely. So I will actually not be able to answer that question. I don't have sufficient expertise. I mean, I've done some reading and some thinking in that area, but I don't consider myself to have sufficient knowledge because I'm still trying to dissect and understand that. I mean, I understand the issues of the soul from the religious perspective and how it's defined, but to be able to answer your question in an intelligent way and give it a fair answer and sort of understand the modern conceptualizations around consciousness and awareness, psyche and so on. I don't think I can do that justice at this point in time, so I'm sorry, I, I don't think I'll be able to answer that. It's a, it's a very complex area and there's, uh, there's obviously a lot of interest in that for many traditions. I, I can't give you a, a simple good answer to that. I think there was, yes sir, in the back. Right. Sure. So this is an ongoing issue of contention, and, and I knew it would come up. It comes up every time. Um, so I have opined and, and, and written on this in, in, in my essay, and when I've presented this view to scholars and we've had these debates, the opinions haven't changed. The general perception is that when dealing with food and water, it is considered a basic human need to provide that. And by uh, any and all means, before feeding tubes and things, to do it naturally through letting people eat and drink, um, you know, food, helping uh, with assistance of feeding and so on. We know that that's generally superior to feeding tubes anyways. And the best scientific evidence that we have to date, and I do not dispute it, at least not in a major way, the quality of the evidence is still limited, but it's hard to do randomized trials in the area. The best evidence suggests we do not prolong life with, with feeding tubes in patients with advanced dementia. Now, I do not dispute that in general. The response from an Islamic perspective is that that's only one circumstance or one factor in the decision making. From a, from a Muslim duty perspective to the family members to provide nutrition and hydration, irregardless of whether or not life is prolonged, the duty is not lifted if you can show that there's no scientific evidence that it will benefit by prolonging life because the duty to provide food and drink is considered a basic human need that is not within the tradition of prolonging life. That's not the goal. It's to provide that minimum duty that people have. Now, does that mean you give them the 1,800 kilocals per day that they need in order to maintain perfect nutrition? No, it's to provide some level of nutrition hydration that meets their, their basic needs and fulfills the duty of, prov of provision of food and drink. 
it's not more clearly defined than that in terms of X number of kilocalories, X percentage, and so on. But what's clear is that in many circumstances, you can't give anything into the mouth uh, through conventional means. And in those circumstances, the scholars that have, uh, that have given opinions on this have said, we, we should or must, depending on the scholar that you look at, um, give food and water by means of feeding tubes, unless that is going to lead to harm and shortening of life, as, as I gave as, as examples, in which case we would not then be obligated to do that. But outside of that, if they don't prolong life and they don't shorten life, but they are neutral, there is still a second set of duties and circumstances that obligates the family to provide food and water through that means. And I know that that's at some uh, discord with a lot of the, the current thinking within, within advanced dementia, but that's the, the current understanding I have and, and the scholars that I've spoken to around that issue for advanced dementia. Yes, ma'am. Sorry? Last? La last? Yeah. Okay, this is the last question. Okay, it's outside. We're, we're done. Oh. And it's a, it's a great question and one in which there's an ongoing debate and discussion and clarification. We don't have all the answers right now. What is clear is a couple of, of thoughts and ha have emerged from some of the scholars and leaders in some of these, these more developing countries. The first is that it is, n it is the duty of the state to provide care for individuals to prolong life and that that duty is beyond the economic means or necessities of the individual families. In other words, if they can afford it, then fine. But if they cannot, then it is the collective obligation of the community. And that community is manifested, whether it's at the city level or the state level or the country level, it, is, it should be manifested within law as a responsibility of the state. Now, whether that's been implemented in every, in, in, all, in the major Muslim countries, for example, I don't know, but that's certainly been part of the discourse in one of the directions that a number of scholars have, have gone in. A second uh, set of arguments have been made about how you are obligated as, for example, the child or family member of someone who's ill to provide treatment um, or pay for that treatment. And some scholars have said, now this is not a majority opinion, but some scholars have said, even if it leads to the personal bankruptcy of that individual, who has to provide that care. On the other hand, they've also immediately said that we also must consider the other financial obligations of that person. If they're the breadwinner and they must provide to all, then they, then, then they are exempt from, from, from having to pay for that loved one's care. In other words, there's still a lot of areas that we don't completely understand. There are also some traditions around rationing ICU beds, for example, when you have sick people and are you allowed to, and that's an area that's ongoing discourse and people are evolving, but certainly the attempt to rationalize at the micro level is something that a number of scholars have said, yes, this is permissible, and of course we have to do it because we can't have an infinite number of ICU beds, and we recognize that there are competing priorities in, in all societies. But that's still an area where not all of the scholars are in agreement, not all of them have given clear opinions on this, not every country has enacted laws to that effect. So it's an evolving area, it's a very interesting area, but one in which there's still a lot of ongoing discussion and debate. And you're right, in many countries and in, and in many cities, there is no ICU, there is no advanced care, you're sort of in, in a small town or whatever, and, and if you can't get the care at home, uh, you might be able to go to a hospital and, and be able to, to get some care there in a, in a basic ward, and then beyond that, that's it. Are you then obligated to say, well, I want to be transferred to a tertiary level facility in this city or another country or whatever? And, and that those are areas that, that it's still not clear on. But some scholars who have talked about that have said, no, it is, you, are, you are expected to do what is reasonable within the circumstances that are reasonable in your local environment. But many scholars have not yet given answers to that, so it's an area where there's ongoing uh, discussions. I think I have to stop and, uh, and, and get out of the, the camera. I honestly don't want to stop you, but I think for your benefit, especially, uh, you know, I think I think we must. And I really want to thank you so much for, first of all, that very comprehensive introduction to uh, 
Islam itself and also Islamic bioethics. I think the similarities are striking. Um, and granted, there have to be some differences as well, but it, it's really very interesting for most of us, I think, to be able to think about the similarities in particular. And I know if we got into deeper conversations about withdrawal of treatment, etc., there would be inevitably differences because there are differences, whether it's within Catholicism, uh, you know, in your, in your own tradition and, and in other traditions. I think what's also very fascinating is, is your approach to suffering. Um, I think that's an area that is needing to be developed because it's such a difficult area in, in all our religious traditions to be able to give some kind of account of what that is like for the person and what can be done through it. And we know it can be transformative in many ways. And, and I think that particular aspect uh, is really um, honed by religious traditions. And I think that's of great benefit to many people when we reach that particular stage. Uh, the, your, your issues at the end in terms of death and dying, I think certainly opened my eyes to the, you know, the reasons for the different ways of dealing with death. Uh, and just very clearly makes sense. I was sort of struck, especially in the, the quality of the questions, obviously excellent, the way you answer them is just, just wonderful. I can see what Rory means by the wonderful Dr. Alibi. But I was kind of struck that the, the more we progress uh, into all these different areas, and perhaps it's because of technology, but the more, even in the way you're talking, it, it depends on the scholars, and it really comes back to reason and that, such a, that there's such a similarity there to our Catholic tradition of relying not just on the scriptures and the holy books, extremely fundamental, but that in fact we do have to come to some kinds of conclusions and agreements based on what we experience as human beings and through the power of reason. So you very clearly indicate that in, in your way of doing both medicine and bioethics, you rely very heavily, of course, on your own faith tradition, on your holy scriptures, but also in that power of reason as well, which I think really we need both uh, to appeal to everybody and not just people of, of religious traditions. And I think that's extremely helpful in how we address these issues in, in the modern world. So I just want to thank you so much for taking the time to come here to be with us tonight and your wife, who's, who's also here with us. And I would also just like to thank everybody else for taking the time to come here tonight. I'm sure like myself, you think this has been a very, very interesting presentation, and please help me to thank Dr. Alibi. I just want to say thank you to uh, the Order of Malta and to who co-sponsored this with us, and in fact, it was Dr. Rory Fisher, who's a colleague of Dr. Alibi, who, who really made this happen, if you like. And also to Bambi, our CCBI administrator, for organizing it. And to Michael from the Catholic Register, who very faithfully comes to deliver reports to that newspaper, and to Evan for videotaping it. And this is, this is wonderful, because it means that for people who aren't here, of course, then we put this on our website, and it goes further afield all the time. So thank you very much, and uh, we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you.